and it's going to be a mix of the AI and both human intelligence. So I say that to say this, we, we have quite a number of challenges presently in the security world and in banking, um, it's not different. The reason why I said it's not different is that uh, people don't come in with machine guns and uh, cutlasses and machetes into our banks no more. I can't remember when last in Nigeria I heard of a bank being robbed like that, apart from like two years ago when of or something like that. But the truth is that 80% of cyber crimes right now, especially against banks, starts with an email, starts with phishing emails. You know, the question that I have is how can, because I asked Greg a, a little before we, we started this discussion, how can AI help us with this? You know, we, we, we have challenges with, with phishing mails, and that's not only in Nigeria, it's even global. Because the sophistication, you also mentioned it during this presentation, that's great. The sophistication in, in the kind of attacks that we see nowadays is so great that you find that the same AI tools that we use, the same machine learning that we use, is the same tools that these guys use. You know, it's almost very difficult for you to even find out some of those things because of the level of sophistication. So I want to put it this way. We, 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 we see day-to-day -day challenges in our banking world, but to put it straight, we leverage on AI, then we leverage on, on the human intelligence as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Femi, for that. And Favor, just to piggyback on that. Even the fact that he says you have to leverage on both the human and the, um, um, the machine to solve this problem, are you in agreement with this? And do you see some specific type of attacks that AI will help for? Um, any some specific ones that humans will also um, necessarily need to be part of it to be able to help solve the problem? And if there are any examples in your experience, to be helpful so that we can relate to it better. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I just have to continue from where we stop. And um, the fishing thing is never going to go away. In fact, it will be on the increase. And as the attackers are also increasing in knowledge, skill, in you know, sophistication of attacks, so also the technology to combat. So it's, it's a cut and mouth race, which will continue to as far as we are all existing. Because phishing is not new, it's been there for you know, social engineering attacks, which is just one aspect of phishing, has been existing for several years. Now, the issue of the banking industry, the kind of threats, um, the threat landscape globally is changing because technology is ever evolving. And the introduction of AI, as good as it is, because, you know, this, uh, this mind about what exactly is even AI, it just helps you to do to do a, a, a lot of analysis, in, you know, in introducing innovations, you know, analysis of large jump data, which everybody is processing now. The entire world is now facing uh, big data. And the issue of data is how do you analyze this big data? And that is why AI is, in, yeah, is part of the tools that we use. Machine learning, deep learning, neural networks, and what have you. All these are just techniques to ensure that you are able to do some modeling to you know, know how to you know, transact your business and get the best out of you know, user experience and customer base. Now, as organizations are leveraging on artificial intelligence, so if uh, attackers, the, the bad guys too, are also leveraging on it. So AI is wearing two caps. You know, you can either use it for good, you can, you can also be used for bad. So how do you ensure that the, the good aspect of AI is to your own advantage? How do you use it to combat uh, cyber crime, cyber security issues? And how do you use it to ensure that you also use it to be able to predict, you know, uh, customer expectation experiences and also increase, I mean, uh, increase your, uh, your, your profit line? So these are some of the, now the attacks on banks, they come in different channels. And we know that uh, many people now, because of the ease of doing business, everybody wants to transact business on the go. You want to do transactions on your mobile devices, you want to do it on your tablet. Now, 
many are not even aware. And I'm also aware of the uh, of, of something that is currently ongoing that will soon be held in very soon, and that is all banks coming together to do a targeted uh, awareness to the entire nation. Because we all face, we all face with common, one common enemy, you know, and, and that is people that want to take uh, money away from customers, either to come in to defraud the bank you know, on cyber attack, or to leverage on individual, take over their identity and take cut away with their money and resources. So there are several things that we're seeing, mobile channels, uh, issues around mobile channels, whereby people are being, identities are being theft and people money are being taken over. These are some of the areas that, you know, are, are quite a challenge, which different, you know, uh, ways of introducing uh, AI to ensure that some of these are combat and also reduced significantly to reduce uh, um, losses for both the consumer and also for the individual banks. So it is a real thing, it is, uh, uh, it, but it's something that uh, together, working together, because awareness on the national level is still very low. Uh, as much as people still get the, many people cannot even differentiate between the right SMS coming from banks and the one that an official is trying to lure them to do. So until we get to the point where an ordinary person on the road can actually detect or be able to, you know, uh, understand what a phishing attack is and how not to fall a victim of such, that is where we can know that we have all achieved. But as it is, we still have a lot of people, you know, their money being sweeping away by small betting and several things that people are taking advantage of. So the knowledge gap is still there and much of an awareness still needs to be employed. Thank you, um, Fibo. So, um, Greg, you will notice they have mentioned two things. One is phishing attacks, phishing emails, and this is both internal and external. And there are a lot of bankers here. They can be compromised and they may have no bad intention, but they will be compromised. I read um, of a case where the finance CFO of a company, his email was hacked through a phishing attack and they studied this pattern of approving documents and then they started generating invoices and sending to the accounts team and they were being paid. And this got, went, went on for about two years and over $10 million was lost before they discovered this. So it's real and it can happen internally. There are a lot of bankers here. So if we're talking awareness, awareness is on the one hand. What can we do for awareness? What can we do on the technology front? You know, you mentioned it here as well earlier. So how can technology and AI help in us fighting phishing attacks in addition to the awareness? Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, hello again. Uh, so where artificial intelligence is going is if we look at digital banking attacks, then it's a high dimensional space. What I mean by a high dimensional space is the amount of data that is available <clears throat> inside of that session is a lot. It's too much for a human to understand and to make sense of inside of moments. So if you imagine the device, the referral, the cookie, uh, the location, the IP, uh, as well as things like the beneficiary, the amount, the, the location of the bank and so forth. So it becomes too complicated for a human to write a expert rule based upon it. So machine learning is very useful in a high dimensional space where there are hundreds of intelligence points or indicators of compromise for every event. So artificial intelligence is very useful at taking this data, learning from it, and then providing an anomaly detection score. So how unusual is that event in comparison to all events for that user, in comparison to all events for all users, for all devices, for all corporations? So he's very good at looking at those types of indicators and providing an impaired score, which is an indicator of risk. That's where artificial intelligence is very good. Um, and there's two types of artificial intelligence, I guess, that we, we focus on there, and that's the unsupervised learning and supervised learning. And in unsupervised learning, typically, uh, the model itself, the machine learning model, the algorithm, is not receiving continual feedback around the different types of attacks. So it's not getting a classification as to the outcome of the attack. So what it's looking at more is, is it unusual based on the events that we've seen and the behavior we've seen. 
Whereas in supervised learning, it's getting that feedback and it's getting the continual learning capabilities from fraud experts, from fraud attacks. So it's then able to um, use that intelligence to learn and to identify attacks similar to that in the future. Now the challenge with that is many of the banks that I speak to simply don't have the capability to provide that type of feedback or even to judge the capability of the current machine learning model, how effective is it? And so an, an example of that is they would use what's called a confusion matrix to understand the different types of alerts that they're getting, whether they're false positives, whether they're false negatives, positive positives, negative negatives. So are these alerts that they want to see? And again, they don't have the tooling or the knowledge, specifically they have a data scientist that understands data, but not the fraud domain. And they have fraud experts that don't understand data science. So there's a knowledge gap that needs to be to be bridged across from that as well. Is there a second part to it that I've missed? Okay. <laughs> Alright, thanks a lot for that in-depth uh, analysis. Um, audience, keep your questions ready. At a point, we will talk to you and we'll take one or two questions. Concept of AI marketing that is all over the place. Many of us are familiar with it. You know, your chats, your chat bots that you chat with with the bank and uh, stuff happening. Or even uh, targeted marketing, retargeting and all that. Instead of you, when I log into my app, you feed me the static, do you want to open a current account, for instance? Maybe the system is now beginning to learn. I've noticed some banks are deploying things like this to learn that what they should serve me is different from what they should serve the next person. Maybe what will interest me is mutual funds, what will interest the next person is a savings account. Depending on my behavior, I've noticed this in some places. So AI, AI marketing seems to be an interesting trend, it's on the rise. But for banks to do this, they don't always work with the technology completely in-house. So they work with uh, service providers or third parties, like you said. Not all banks have the capability in-house, you know, to train that model and you know continue to learn from it and all that. So when you work with third parties, and we're talking about customer data here, how do you think banks should treat personally identifiable information of customers? Because these machine learning models need to be trained, and they need to be trained with data of people you know, their transactions, the nature of the transactions, and stuff like that. And some of this information may be, you know, for instance, there's an NDPR rule that she treats how you treat data. So, what's your perspective on how financial institutions, yours and others in the audience, how financial institutions should treat PII when dealing with AI marketing? Anyone can go um, first. Okay, the truth of the matter is all organizations, all banks, will always need data to do all the analytics that they are doing. But how these data are handled is what matters. Now, even if there's no GDPR or NGDPR, the one that we have locally, it's not there. I mean, it is a responsibility of the bank to ensure that the data of the consumer or the customer that they're using are protected. The age of uh, agile banking, open banking, everybody is just crazy to drunk out products, to bring out things, to be the first to do it, to take the consumer, to take everybody unaware. But the thing is, many are not building security into what they're doing. Neither are they working in synergy among uh, interdependent matter and synergy. In the sense that uh, we have a lot of whiskey guys doing fantastic things, developing programs on the street, on the road. Now, people are just taking advantage of that, employing them, they will deploy this thing. But this guy deployed this thing without thinking security. They deploy them without even having an understanding of what the culture of that organization is. They are risk averse, you know, their risk appetite to security or cyber security issues or threats. So they just, you know, quickly bundle the products and here it goes because there's no governance around how products are released and uh, how uh, what it should go through um, the change management control the several levels of certification it must go through before it is released to the market 
and you see them release something that is so porous and so vulnerable, and before you know it, it's already, they have used it as an inroad road to defraud the bank. Because one of the things is, uh, I mean, the, one of the easiest ways that attackers do is, was that and, uh, a vulnerability is, uh, is spotted on your network and is being exploited. The first thing is just to go in, come in, and of course start doing uh, lateral movements within your network. But outside that, you know, before you know it, they you know, start communicating with their command and control, and thereby bringing in more tools that they can use to leverage, escalate privileges, and get to where their real crown jewels is, and know how to begin to manipulate things. And of course, they can stay there as long as possible, and do it in a way that it will be so difficult for you to know if you don't have that level of capacity, knowledge, you know, in-house tech, uh, um, expertise and whatever to do it. And the issue that you have, there are so many thoughts that people have around that are not seeing not, nothing because they're just joking out false positive alert that is not going to, you can't make any decision with. So that is why a lot needs to be, we need to do a lot of things. Chat is good, chat bots, at whatever is good because companies leverage your needs to get to understand how they, I mean, to serve their customers well. You want to know the behavior analysis of your customer, you want to know how to serve them best, and customer will always tend to move to the company that can serve them better. But then, there is what that we need to do, and that is ensure that security is embedded. It's not an afterthought. It is embedded from the beginning, from layer to layer of security, embedded to the extent that even if, I mean, because attempts will always be made on you, but they are able to, so, to succeed is another thing. Just like the picture he, paint, uh, he painted while he was speaking, a bird could fly over your head, but you can prevent a bird from making a nest over his on your head. So and that is why this attack, they will continue to fly, incident will continue to happen all over the world, but then that you are not a victim, you, you can you all, I mean, because you have so much fortify yourself and you are deterring them, you're making it difficult. So they will leave you when they're tired of you know trying and go to the cheap ones. That they can easily leverage on. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Fimo. I mean, you have something to add on how the banks can secure you know, this customer data while still undergoing, while still deploying technology in terms of AI marketing and working with these their partners to bring more service to the customer. How can they secure the BI? This customer? morning, this morning I'm the sound a bit of problem. That's because um, of the way technology is going presently. Technology is becoming very flexible, adaptable, non-monolithic, not the typical um, web server, app server, database that we know. You know, everything is going more modular and. Um, the rate at which our customers are expecting us to turn out these applications as banks is amazing, it's alarming. Maybe it's the customers that are getting lazy, maybe it's the banks that are getting very fast forwarded, you know. I wouldn't want to say, but the, the truth is that the chatbot thing has come to stay. And uh, we as security professionals will not be the stumbling block. You know, just like Chibuzo said, all we need to do is to um, look for ways. And I'm going to come to a couple of, of things that we can do to help um, that, that, uh, that innovation. Um, one of them, maybe I should just go straight to it because I can, I can just... One of them is end-to-end -end encryption. You ensure that from the beginning of your transaction, to the end of that transaction, it is totally encrypted. Whether you're using a chat bot, whether you're omni-channel, whether you whatever you're using for your artificial intelligence marketing has to be encrypted from the beginning to the end. So that is the first step solution that we should look at. Because I always look at my own solution from every touch point. You know, when the USSD thing, thing came around, it was like that, so there was a big exposure. Again, there's, there's two factor 
which is a no-brainer when it comes to this field. You can't keep people's data and leave it open. You know, another thing that people do nowadays, especially people who have, um, we call it, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the term, um, one single source of data truth, um, MDM, Master Data Management Solutions, and you can actually, what they do, they go to the extent of what we call intent level authorization, and what we call self-destructive messaging. We also, as security professionals, have to start thinking in that direction, so that when We've done our encryption, we've done our two-factor, we've done our intent level authorization. Then you now have the message itself self-destructing. I, I think it's going to take, you know, we, we've done our bit. So it's left for you as a chatbot owner to, <laughs> to now give it all out to the attacker. Thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks a lot for that end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, we've noted that. Um, is there any question from the audience? I'd like to take one. Or two. You want to add to it? Okay. I think in addition to the end-to-end -end, uh, encryption, biometrics have always been here and is still relevant in this in this instance. I know a lot of uh, organizations is also uh, leveraging on um, biometrics as well, authentication and authorization, because authorization will determine that when that person actually is authenticated, what can that person do? What is it? I mean, what are the, uh, the privileges given? What can the, well, the person be able to do on that particular platform? So that is also very, very essential. You know, authentication aspect, whereby then the timeout of authentication is also very, very important. You know, where you have a session that is uh, open-ended, that can also easily be adjusted. So authentication should have timeouts to the extent that it can only be valid for a particular time, period in time. So combining some of these solutions together will make any of these products and things that they're joking out to serve people and make their data be secure. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. In terms of um, the question you asked around uh, how should we treat the data, the AI data, um, you should anonymize the data. For sure, um, because what you don't want to have is PII data that's available. Likely, you should ask questions about data. Um, so rather than storing the real data, you should store the output of the question that's then used in the machine learning model. You should store your machine learning model as of the algorithm, because ultimately that might have made a decision. So if, if that decision was wrong, then you need to be able to provide the outcome of that as an order expected. Um, you should ensure you've got good controls in place before you change your algorithm to make sure it's a fair representative for all of your customers. So this is the type of thing to be in should like to find as well. All right, thanks for that. Do we have any questions from the audience? I also have another question of mine, the final one. All right, the, young, the gentleman in suits down there, we'll take two, and then the man behind him. Coming with the microphone. Please make the question short, and if you want to direct it to any member of the audience, of the panel, that would be great. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Ike Izeji from FCMA. I have a question that bothers around um, cyber security and financial inclusion. Right now, we're talking about financial inclusion. We're looking at the people who are on the bat, and we know that most of these people are actually poorly educated, let's put it that way, not so knowledgeable. Now, most of the things we've been saying here, I can guarantee you that many of us, it even still flies above our heads. Let's talk of those people out there. And you know that the major points of vulnerability is the knowledge gap. How are we going to include or ensure that the level of vulnerability, like he had asked before, we know that it cannot be eliminated, but to be reduced. How are we going to ensure that we reduce that knowledge gap? Because we all know that the chain is as strong as its weakest link. And those guys are the weakest link in this chain. How are we going to ensure that structures are going to be put in place? Let me give you an instance. You go to an ATM today, they tell you some new things like, don't give anybody your whatever, the bank will not call you. Yes, those are good enough. But each time we go out to markets, these people out there, the first thing they tell you, I don't want to use that ATM card because I heard that a million dollars or whatever was stolen from some 
what are those structures that are being put in place? Because if we don't do those things now, we will not meet that target. Thank you. Are you directing it to anyone? Any of them can answer that. Um, what you've said is very correct. And if you recall, that I made mention of something that um, there is something that the Committee of CISO is working on uh, within the banking industry in Nigeria, and that is to do a targeted um, awareness. You know, for that will touch that will have a touch point on every individual. Not just for me and you that is wearing suits or wearing, you know, putting on time, but for those people that are vulnerable, those people that they are bank and that will have, that we are still, we're still trying to say we want to include a financial inclusion. They need to understand this message. We need to take it down to their level, to their dialects, to the to the way they can understand all this grammar that we're growing over their heads. We need to let them know how to interpret it and how to understand and be able to make right decision and protect themselves. And that is what very soon is going to be. So we we'll use different things to ensure that we get the message across. And it's, just, it's not just about one bank, it's about all banks coming together and facing the common enemy and ensuring that their users, their consumer, understand how to protect themselves better while doing service with them. Thank you. Um, can we have the second question and then we we'll close? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. My name is Warren from Rubik Software. Uh, I just want to ask you uh, from security to pick up the start of rent. Uh, we see ransomware attacks globally. I think we see one, you know, one every 14 seconds, and next year they, they expect that to be one every 11, 11 seconds. What are your thoughts from a security perspective around how you can safeguard should you have? The ransomware attack. I think it's not about how they end, it's about when they end. Right? They are really getting in some stage. We see them all the time. I mean, I've created a, a Google alert every time there was a ransomware attack mentioned globally in my inbox explore. So, what do we do to protect our data in the back end should a hacker get into our environment via some of the methods you, you described around phishing attacks and so on? Should they get in there? How do we, how do we protect our data and what are your thoughts around that? Okay, I'll give that a start. Um, ransomware, a lot of people, just like you rightly said, um, in the industry, people thought that 2018 was it, and then we're not going to see ransom, ransomware again. But recently, about some weeks ago, we still heard of some attacks, and then that means it has come to stay. But, um, from a banking security perspective, what we've done in some of the places I've worked before and where I'm working now is to ensure that whatever data that we have on our systems, you know, today we, we <laughs> today th things are going um, digital and, you know, we're leveraging on the cloud for a lot of, or for a lot of things. Most of what we have right now, I don't just have it on my system. I have it stored somewhere in somebody else's computer in the cloud as we, as we talk about it. So um, as I'm working, it's, it's that interesting. As I'm working on my system today, the technology has helped me in such a way that I make sure that every of my user system does an auto sync to that system in the cloud maybe on Azure, maybe on any of the Amazon or whatever the cloud system is. But the, the truth is that that is the first step. The second step is that all the major anti-malware, anti-viruses um, have regular signatures looking at ransomware right now. You know, it used to be, it used to be a pain, it used to be a source of concern. It is still a source of concern, so don't get me wrong. It is still a source of concern. But as we speak, we as security people, we also um, try to be ahead. We're thinking of a lot of things to do, and we will keep keep getting at it as we go. I don't know if Greg has a point of view to this. I can I can try. It's not really my uh, field of expertise as such. Um, but in, in terms of uh, ransomware, likely you want to ensure you all your machines are updated regularly. Uh, the WannaCry attack that was in the UK was because the um, health service machines were not up to date. Um, so you want to ensure that all of your um, machines are up to date. 
but you also have the risk of bringing your own device. Um, so you bring your own device, you're not in control of that, of that um, machine itself. Um, so you also need to look at you know, what's happening to the data and what type of activity is going on in the background on all of those machines. And you need to sniff that type of traffic and see what, what is going on uh, from an enterprise risk to see, okay, how are, how are these machines acting? What is that, what are the activity on those machines? Um, storing your, your, your data in a secure place, ensuring you have the capability to roll back and not paying out when the attack happens because that's funding for more attacks. Thank you. Um, due to lack of time, we need to wrap up. Um, we'll wrap up by a closing remark. And in a closing remark, I would like you to go this way. I'd like you to say something to any bank who is intending to get deeper into security and AI and behavior analysis. Any tips for them from your experience? While I favor, I'd like you to uh, take it from the angle of other professionals in the audience that are into security who may be afraid that their jobs will be on the line with all these technology advancements. Are there any things they should look out for? Or are there any skills they need to take to learn, to understand, in this evolving age of learning? So, um, for me, my message to the banks is um, from experience, we're not patient. When I say we're not patient, we we want to we want to do things in our own parlance. We call it sharp sharp, you know. So to the banks, to to those of us that want to deploy security solutions, what I want to say is that you are not going to get a plug and play security solution. You are going to understand the environment. You are going to understand even if you use machine learning, machine has to still learn the environment. So if uh, we don't give our security professionals that time to uh, to fix the solution, and you think those solutions will just come into your environment, and you just plug them and play them, and it will start detecting or resolving solutions or security issues, then I don't think that is going to work. Thank you. <laughs> Um, for the security professionals in the house, may I just say that um, your, your job is getting more defined and more borderless and uh, more and the, the scope of work is increasing by the day. And as far as any organization that wants to really survive and really make, I mean, have not just faced out just like that, they have to think security. So your, your role is still very, very important. It's not going to go away. So security becomes so relevant in these days and so important because the threat landscape is ever changing. And so as technology is evolving, the landscape of threat is evolving as well. It's also a massive, it's changing. So the, the issue of personal development, you know, is very, very important. You need to understand what is happening. You need to keep yourself abreast of uh, all the strength as they happen around the globe. You also need to remain relevant, you know, in your field because without that, you will not be able to know how to secure your various organization. And regardless of the size of your organization, threat has no regard for size of organization. Threat is threat anyway, as long as you are the cheapest victim that they can explore or exploit then you still see somebody in your, head, in your network or even on your mobile. Many people don't even know that uh, their phone has been hijacked, has been turned to a botnet. You know, it's as bad as that. So it's not only a data center, it's not only an organization. Personal people, individual people, your phone, your laptops could have been turned to a botnet and you are not aware by reason of your behavior as in internet browsing behavior. So all these things, we are all in this together, and security is everyone's responsibility. It should never be an afterthought. It's not the CISO's job alone, it's her job. We are all here to ensure that our space is secure. Thank you. And closing for you, Greg, um, how should banks here, when they talk conference, they were talking about innovation, and then we're here talking about security, and we slow down innovation. How should banks look at security while not slowing down their innovation? Great question. 
Um, it, go, it goes hand in hand in that security should enable innovation. Um, I, I showed earlier on the capability, for example, if you apply a continuous monitoring, to give the right type of authentication to the user. That's making it more secure, it's bringing the context of the authentication, plus it's giving a better user experience as well. Um, so it should go hand in hand. Typically it was seen as a trade-off, but actually it should seen as, a, as an enabler. Um, to answer the question on um, what can banks do already around artificial intelligence, well they can look at the data that they have available right now and think, okay, how can we link this data together? Because likely the data is in different silos. Um, for example, if you have a back-end transactional payments uh, monitoring system, how does that correlate to an electronic banking, digital banking uh, solution? How does it correlate to a mobile banking solution? How does that correlate to um, a, a card present transactional solution? So how do you bring all these data sets together? That's something you should already be thinking about as a bank. How, can we, how are we going to be able to correlate this data? For professionals, um, what can you do? Well, there's free courses, um, Coursera, Harvard schools, that, that will allow you to uh, take a keen interest in data science and machine learning. And how should you see artificial intelligence in your job? If you're an analyst or if you're an expert, well, it should provide actionable intelligence. It should do the hard work of the analysis that a machine was designed to do, an algorithm was designed to do, to give you an output that you can take a decision on, rather than you having to do all that research yourself. And what you should think of is that it hopefully will bypass any type of bias that you have as a professional. Data availability bias, um, affirmation bias, where you have learned something because you have seen it. Um, availability bias means Maybe you have seen this amount of attacks, but you don't see all events. For me, I've learned a lot about how we need to educate the customers and the consumers about how as banks we need to take our security internally uh, very seriously, about how we must apply behavioral analysis, about how we must secure and encrypt and anonymize the data of our customers when passing it through these models. And you know, there's so much more we have learned today. So thank you to the panel, thank you to the audience. A round of applause for them, please.